Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. Open your Bibles again today. Luke chapter 12. I trust that you've had a good week. I've had a good week. It's been a challenge, but it's always good when it's a challenge in the Lord. Amen. Amen. I've titled today's message, The Right Size Barn. And we're going to look at this parable of the rich fool. So open your Bibles to, again, Luke chapter 12. Follow along as I read the parable. And, um, and then we'll go from there. Luke 12, verse 16. And he told him a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. Again, if you have your markers out and stuff, there's some key words in here that you just have to get a hold of, all right? Just notice, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. Oh, my goodness. Verse 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have so many goods laid up for so many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and how? And now who will own what you have prepared? So this man who stores up treasure for himself and not is rich towards God. Now, again, we're, we're key on context, remember? Being big on context and it would be out of context not to back up a little bit, right? And point out the overall general context of this chapter and how it leads up to Jesus telling this parable, all right? Because before that, he gives his disciples two really warnings that kind of really brings us all together, both of which are about wealth. And what's interesting, one is about, yes, material wealth, but another one is about spiritual wealth which brings us back to the parable, which is really about both, isn't it? So let's look. The first warning comes in Luke 12, verse 11, right after Jesus warns them. So in verse 1, he warns them of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And he says, you're to say nothing, or, or he basically tells them, nothing is concealed from God, and that, every, er, that everyone... Um, everything about everyone is disclosed. He warns them not to fear about the one who can kill you, but really fear the one who can kill you, the devil. He also encourages them with the fact that he knows every hair in their heads and that we are known by God. So he's telling us these things, he's encouraging us, and then he gives a promise and a warning about confessing him before men, right? With a warning not to blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God if you want to be forgiven your sins all of which speaks of a spiritual wealth. Then he says in verse 11, look at verse 11 and 12 with me. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, this is interesting because this right here is talking about a spiritual wealth that would come out of pride, and in fact, he wants them to be literally in a very humble state. I don't know how to say it. I was going to say an impoverished state. They're not, but he wants them to be very humble with that, totally relying upon not their own pomp and strength, but on the Holy Spirit. Because here, he says, don't be anxious when you're brought before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities. In other words, you will be, Right? And don't worry about what you are to answer and say. Now, I might add, it was no little thing to them because how the outcome of some of those meetings would come out, right? It could mean life or death to them. In other words, in sticking with this theme of the least, right? The last, the little, the lost being the, being the targets of grace. Those are the ones that Jesus would literally has indicated through these parables of grace who are going to be the winners, literally, in society. Those who are dead to themselves and totally dead in Christ, which makes them alive spiritually, right? He's telling the disciples, look, be poor, be lost. Be as good as dead to yourself. Don't rival in any religious pomp or any of pride of your knowledge or who you think you are in me, right? Without 
riches or, or pride of a well-prepared -pre case, I guess I could say, to take before them. And, and I, want you to have, I don't want you to have the luxury of knowing what's going to happen, what's going to be the outcome of the meetings. In other words, without any comfort sense other than total reliance upon the Holy Spirit of God, He will tell you, He will carry you, He'll walk you through what you need. It's amazing to me. In other words, I guess I could say it this way, they were told to stand in spiritual poverty of their own wisdom and strength and in total death of their own ability to defend themselves, all the while trusting the Holy Spirit to speak in their behalf through them, giving them spiritual wealth. <laughs> it's like, can you have it either way? I think so. Now, it's a warning, needless to say, that any of us would hardly heed because if you think about it, of all the desires for wealth on earth, and now when we think of wealth, we think of material things, but, uh, but in all the desires of wealth, practically the last one, I think that any Christian, if, if he had a chance to think about, about it, I think the last wealth that any Christian would give up would be mental and spiritual wealth, the riches of knowledge of God. And here, Jesus is only asking his disciples and us, as an example, to do what he himself did in his own trial and passion. And that was to lay his own life down and to let God, come on, let God raise it up in his own good time. And if you remember, again, as we saw early in this series, Jesus was trying to teach his, his disciples, look, it's not the, the winners are not going to be those who are winners in the eyes of the world, but it's going to be those that are really humble, like the children, those are the ones that are totally dependent, reliant upon God, they're the ones that are going to be the victors. Are you with me? All right, now, the second warning comes to us, verse 13. Take a look at verse 13 with me. Someone in the crowd says, Hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to them, this is Jesus, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter, arbiter over you? And when he... Then he, then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Kind of cool. You got a crowd, probably a younger brother. We know that, um, you know, culture, the firstborn got double. Hey, teacher, all right? Even, even if this guy's case was plausible and, and, and genuine, Look, we know Jesus' ministry was not about the incidental patching up of this stuff on earth, but it was about final justice. The death and rising up from this earth realm and, and reconciling not just one squabble, but the entire creation back to God. That's why he adds, guard yourself against all covetousness or every form of greed. That Greek word literally speaks of um, having much, much having. Watch yourself. Watch your heart, what Jesus is saying about that stuff. Now, the bottom line is, look, if you, if you hang on, if you clutch at, our, at your life rather than, you know, open your hands to our, to our death in Christ, if we, if we hang on to the only thing we know rather than embrace eternity and, and Jesus in the kingdom, you know, that's the real life that comes by resurrection. And, it, and it'll, it'll just remain permanently out of your reach if it's all about me, myself, and I, and you can't take it with you, so you've got to hoard it while you're on earth. All of that then, okay, brings us back to this parable. So if you go back to the parable, right? Here we go, the rich fool, right? Now, this is what's key. Here's what we know. This person was permit, materially blessed by God, because he owned the land. Now, I want you to just think outside of the box a little bit, all right? For starters, he's not a fool. He's a rich guy. I wouldn't consider the guy a fool. He's got assets. He's buying, selling, trading. There's nothing here. He's probably a farmer. He, he owns land. He's done well. You know, if you're going to grow a crop you've, and you've irrigated and you, and you put people in the field and you've weeded and you've done all the things, you've taken care of it, you, you've keeping the beast of burden out of there. I don't see anything wrong with the guy. Matter of fact, hey, you go, you go, boy, go. Look at you, right? He's a rich guy. The fact that he's a fool is because God calls him a fool. Now watch this, right? Here's what we know. 
He was materially blessed by God because his land produced plentifully or was very productive. In other words, the land he owned brought an increase to him. Now, there's a break point here. This guy wasn't born a fool. This guy was a rich guy who's done well. Uh, you really got to get a hold of this. He's not a bad guy. This isn't a bad guy. What happened was he was rich and then he got richer. He was well taken care of and then he has a bumper crop again. Again, that just adds to what he already had. In other words, at this point, what I want you to see is this. This is the point right here, right? Instead of using the increase to further manage, right? Instead of using the increase to further the will of God, let me say. All he was interested in was, interested in was managing his increase and accumulating his growing wealth. This is where... God decided for him how much is enough. Oh my gosh. Get a hold of this. If you don't get anything else today, understand this. What God wants us to do is to be able to make a decision how much is enough in our hearts, in our lives, before God has to make that for you. Right? Think about it. I don't know how else to say it. How much is enough? In other words, as a Christian, you may have more dollars and cents than I have dollars and cents, but, but I may not need that amount. My lifestyle, your, your lifestyle, none of our lifestyles are evil in and of themselves. It's just what the heart has in there about what we have in our possession. Look, we know God owns it all anyways, right? You know that. You are just a steward. Here's what I know. On earth, I've got a lot of missions, man. I've got a lot of gift mix. I've got a lot of things I want to do. But ultimate, ultimately, the one thing that I want to do while on earth is to die well. In other words, die fully embracing the kingdom of heaven that's at hand and all of its principles. And part of that, man, is the generosity of what God allows me to steward and how I work with that, Right? Nobody, uh, here's a good example, okay? I'm going to be humble before you, but here's a good example. So I don't have a lot of personal resources or accumulated wealth, but I'm a very rich man, right? I live in a mobile home. I have my whole life, but that's okay. It's paid for. And, and it's a very, it's a, the quality of life is amazing there, okay? I'm down at the church. I have a neighbor call me and says, hey, man, I need some help. I go over there and I end up, laying my sermon down for the afternoon and I end up caulking and getting out a paint sprayer and painting the end of the house for him because the man is enabled. I love this guy. I love this neighbor. And it's all good. See, it wasn't a dollar and cents. It wasn't me. Well, let me hire somebody to come in here and do that. I just, you just, generosity, man. It's, it's in your heart. It's all about what's in your heart and what you can give with what you have, without God determining for you, that's enough, or you're not given enough. Hang on. All right, now. So what happens? The guy builds bigger barns in place of the existing ones, and he starts planning an early retirement. Okay? Verse 20, and God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? Right? He finishes the parable in verse 21. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, the fourth thing is this. He goes from rich to fool to perishing in his wealth. Amazing. And with the dying question, think of it this way. If the soul is eternal, with, with, the, with the looming Last question on your heart of this. Now who will own what you have prepared? In other words, what the heck? You crammed all that stuff in these barns and now you're gone. Today your soul is required of you. You can't give it away. Now it's gone. It, it, it's just amazing to me. 
Now, now I want you to notice, again, first of all, the farmer was already rich, all right? The man had not become rich by that harvest, but that harvest only added to what he had. And that put him in a place of choice because he didn't need the added wealth to sustain himself or his household. Thus, when the new harvest came, that's when he showed the true condition of his heart in that he had no concern for his neighbor. And rather than seeing the increase of putting it in other people's mouths, he thought about, well, I'll just build a bigger barn. That's why in his statement here, in the Jesus quotes a man as saying six times he says, I will, and I think four times, my, 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 six eyes and four my's. <laughs> in other words, this was a point in the guy's life where God puts him over the top, of his possessions and his stewardship and now requires him to be a good steward. Why? God owns it anyways. And you're hoarding what I own. That's what basically God is saying. Look, I, the point Jesus is making that the rich person is not determined by the amount of possessions. Any rich person. Then, now, all time and eternity. But rather by their heart attitude of what they have. You're going to be measured by your heart's attitude. And the more you do with what you have, the more you will be given to be a steward over. Just God's overlying biblical principles. You can agree with that or not, but that's just it. This is while the man considered himself to be sovereign over his possessions. This, this parable moves on to show that God was really the one in charge of his wealth, sovereign over the whole man's life. And the man was pronounced, pronounced to be a dead fool. I will just say this back when I was at Evergreen Christian Community Church there and uh, we left there to plant a church uh, back 1993 I believe it was and um, we found a building we wanted to buy. We were down in the community center. Some of you know the story. There was a building that was for sale, church building. We believed by faith. We prayed and um, didn't have the resources for that. But there was an, an elder widow that attended Evergreen at the time. You would never tell that she had a dime to her name by her looks, by the way she dressed, super humble. But when she died, her possessions, her barn, was given in a trust to the church for missions, home and foreign. And all she asked was, that a portion of that be invested so that it could perpetually, it could live off the earnings and that it could perpetually give. And I know that back in the day, it, it, that money, so it was a great deal of monies, it produced, it produced a, it paid for a missionary house. And then also, when we wanted to buy that building, we borrowed that money, we borrowed that money as a church plant to be able to swing the deal, to get the building, to get it into our name, to get an asset, to do a, a re-roof job and otherwise than to refinance the building. And, and this, widow's, this widow who lived humbly her whole life that, that gave of her possession, she gave her barn, that thing produced 17 and a half years of ministry there. The church continues on. We are here at Maytown. And it just it's an amazing example of her heart. And no one really knew, and no one knew her heart. I mean, those close to her knew. I didn't even... I knew her face. I didn't know who she was. I'd never been in her house. But that's, that's what God is saying. Look, that lady was so rich. She was so rich of heart. And that's what happened. And what happens? The kingdom is established. The kingdom grows. And, and generations receive from what was in her barn. Say amen. Do you hear me? Say amen. All right. Now, on the purpose, just right on the purpose of this parable, let me bring you a couple of things, twofold. Number one, we're not to devote our lives to the gathering and accumulation of wealth, wealth with no purpose. This is the key. Wealth with no purpose of being a blessing or provision for no one but yourself. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. No, but store for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Which brings me to an interesting point made in the parable where God then says to the man in verse 20, now who will own what you have prepared? In other words, hey mister, 
the things you've prepared, who will they belong to once you're gone? Right? <laughs> you see it all the time in people who are singularly devoted, I would say crooked generally. A lot of times they're just totally devoted to their, their own accumulation of wealth. And, and what happens to all that when they, when they die? It's interesting. I, I started thinking about that. I started thinking about someone like Bill Gates. I mean, he was growing up, he was like the richest guy in the world. He's been surpassed many times over now. But, you know, they didn't have any kids at the time. And I thought, wow, you know. So what do they do? They just, they make these big foundations and these stuff to, to, to carry on their message. And in a lot of cases, their anti-Christ message. It's interesting. The, the American Atheist Society or American atheists they they say right on their webpage hey take all of your your accumulated wealth all your barns and give it to us and and join our legacy circle so that the legacy of not believing in god can go on for generations behind you we'll take your money give it to us amazing to me i wouldn't want i wouldn't want the last words on my heart or the revelation dying outside of Christ in relation to his God to be something like now who will own what you have prepared. The second point I want to make is this. We're not blessed by God to hoard our wealth. You know, we go through life, we work hard, you 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 do this and that. You got to understand, God's sovereign over everything. You say, no, wait a minute, I built my kingdom. I worked hard. I I worked two jobs. Okay, okay. You worked hard, and through that you've been blessed, and now you're there. There's some point in your life where enough is enough. You don't want God to decide that for you like this rich man. You want to make that decision out of yourselves. A lot of people struggle with a lot of things when it comes to kingdom work, giving to missions or giving to the local church tithing. How much is enough? It's amazing to me. Now, we're blessed to be a blessing in our lives to others, and we're blessed to build the kingdom of God. That's just it. The Bible says if our riches increase, we're not to set our hearts upon them, Psalms 62.10. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.24, there is one who gives freely and grows all the richer. In other words, give to get, to give again to get, to give again to get. Finally, the Bible says we're to honor God with the first fruits of all of our hearts. You've probably heard that, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and from the first fruits of all of your produce. In other words, from the best, the top 10%, the best of what you have. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, could have worked for this rich man, but instead... God calls him a fool and God calls him out of this world. I think the point is very clear. If we honor God with what he's given us, he'll bless us with more so that we can honor him even more. I want that. You want that? I want that. Does that sound silly? I want to be a contagious, crazy, gracious giver of time, of resources, of you know whatever it takes, monies. Paul said it well. He said, now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do what he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Remember this too, okay? There are a lot of people like this rich guy that give for tax purposes. So I got to give so much of this money for tax benefits. You can be rich, you can be a big giver, but not a cheerful giver. Be cautious with this. If it's all on paper and it's not in your heart, it's not going to do you much good. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that, so that always having all sufficiency, look at this, you may have an abundance for every good deed. In other words, give it away and I'll make sure you have plenty always to give away. Wow. Wow. In other words, we are blessed by God so we can in turn abound in every good work and be a blessing in the lives of others. 
Bottom line, if God has blessed you with material wealth, set your set not your heart on it and rather be rich towards God. And that's the message of the rich fool. That is it in a nutshell. And although the parable kind of ends there, Jesus kind of beefs it up here in kind of the kind of a rolling dialogue at the end because verse 22 on is a section of scripture. It mirrors kind of Matthew 6 when he warns us not to be anxious about food or clothing. Instead about worrying about tomorrow, he tells his disciples to invest in eternal purposes and let God take care of their physical needs. And then ends the lesson with a call for his believers to sell their possessions and give to the needy. So here's the balance of what I'm hearing from Jesus. As we plan for the future, we must also plan for generosity. If we focus on bigger barns and we don't see the needs around us, we might just become rich fools ourselves. Oh, you don't want to be called a rich fool by God. And to prevent this, we have to first identify the barns in our lives. Now, be gracious and humble, but just listen with me, okay? Let me give you some practical understanding of what a financial barn might look like in today's world, right? I would say any savings or investment vehicle where wealth accumulates for the use into the future, far into the future, could be savings designated for a specific purpose like a 401k retirement, uh, funds being stockpiled but not earmarked, like a wealth building account. Maybe it's a non-financial investment where extra money gets dumped in something like a vacation home, whatever. Those are all really wise, good investments. So please hear me. None of those things are inherently evil. And many of them, again, would be considered very wise. However, it's the purpose of the investment. It's what's in here. It's the purpose of the, it, the, purpose of the investment that God is concerned about. In other words, when we look back at this rich man in my parable... Again, he comes into the story as a rich man and not criticized for that. He's not criticized for the barns he has, but he leaves as a rich fool condemned for building bigger barns to store his access. The key then becomes building the right size barn in your heart. Boom. Say it again. The key is building the right size barn in your heart. Look, it's not that God doesn't want us to save for retirement or future needs. Come on. It, the church isn't telling you, give all your money to me. I'm not trying to sell you trinkets or promise you that God will bless you if you give to me. Uh, here's what I'm saying. God owns what you have. Don't let him decide when you have enough. Do it on your own. Build the right sized kingdom barn in your heart. God doesn't care if we eat, drink, or be merry with what we have, right? It's about the stewardship that we have over what we have. And it's all about priorities. It's how we invest our lives and the gifts God has given us and how our lives are fundamentally aligned towards ourselves and our passing desires are towards God and our neighbor. Let me just close with these thoughts. One seasoned pastor wrote this. He said, I've heard many different regrets expressed by people nearing the end of their life or on their deathbed, but there's one regret that I've never heard expressed. I've never heard anyone say, I wish I hadn't given so much away. I wish I had kept more for myself. Why? Because death has a way of clarifying what really matters. In other words, when you face death and you know you can't take it with you, there's no grief or sorrow for what you gave up on earth. Look, our lives and possessions are not our own. They belong to God. We're merely stewards of them for the time God has given us on earth. As King David prophesied, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. To some, this truth can be troubling. You know what? To me, I just, I am so encouraged. You know, 
I'm sure this message had been used, and we're in a building fund for building funds, for tithes and offerings. Uh, I've heard it all. I mean, I'm no young rascal. I've been around for a lot of years. I've heard a lot. But to me, this truth right here, the challenge is comforting me. And you want to know why? My faith and my hope is in God. And if God owns everything now, how much more when I head on into eternity? In other words, because if all that we are and all that we have belongs to God, <laughs> my future is secure in Him. I bring, I get solace out of that. So let me ask you this. Do you have the right size barn in your heart? It's always a challenge. It always is. There has been a lot that have used a lie or the skin of truth, I guess, stuffed with a lie when it comes to tithes and offerings and giving and whatever. Here's what I know. You can't outgive God. Uh, Teresa and I have been faithful in our our giving, that's our business before the Lord. We don't brag in it, nor do we try to compare numbers because it's humble, but we do what we do. One time in our lives, we were able to give a very substantial gift, and that was one of the most joyous times in our lives, being able to write a check for that large sum of money. It was just amazing. It was amazing. And I thought then, you know what, Lord, I'd love to do that more often. I'd love to do that. How do I do that? How do I get to that? Understand this. You've got to have the right size barn in your heart. How much is enough? How much is enough? I want to pray for you today. I really feel that God wants to really do a good work in you. If you're listening today, look, let's just be friends. Let's talk. If you struggle with giving consistently, tithes, um, I remember back in the old days, we had tithing envelopes. You could sign up for them, and, and the church would send you these envelopes with every week dated on it. Some people were so intimidated by that. Why, you know, the church? No, nah, no, the church. Some of you have a problem with that. Some of you have a problem with some Christian communities or maybe a preachers or evangelists that went south. It happens. We're all people. They went south, took the money, whatever, and therefore we're all like that. Well, I don't know, but I know one thing. Don't look at them. Look at God. Don't let him determine for you how much is enough. I want to pray this prayer for you. Just receive this, Father, in Jesus' name. For those that struggle with this dynamic, Lord, I, I pray the Holy Spirit go to them right now. If they are born again, the Holy Spirit bear witness in them. You already own everything. You own all the cattle on a thousand hills. All the earth and all the, everything in the earth is yours. It's already owned by you and it, everything it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, we're all, it's all God's creation. What would it be like if the Spirit of God did something in us today, I just pray, Lord, that made us all contagious givers? If we look to where we could help the neighbor, if we look to where we could give, if it's a simple cup of cold water or if it's something very significant, I just pray that you'll do a supernatural work within us, within all of us. That that barn will be the right size, that you don't have to tell us that, but we'll realize that as we operate as sons and daughters. Remember, you just said, come to us, right? Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, this daily bread, give me my daily bread. Let me eat today and tomorrow. Lead me not into temptation. Let me forgive the others that, that have wronged against me God and just and I want to be led in the way everlasting Lord I just pray that anybody listening I pray that they get solace in the fact that you own it you own even what they have stored or stashed or locked up and how much greater would we be if our barn was the right size and we just genuinely generously gave good gifts so that you can press it down and pour it back into our laps with the same measure that we gave. I just pray supernatural, supernatural just change of heart for many in Jesus' name. Amen, <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Oh, God is good. God is good. Hey, for your tithes and offerings, again, go to MaytownAG.com. Uh, we are in person here, 1030, 
a one service on Sundays right now. And uh, you can join us here. If it's really nice, we're outside underneath the maple tree. It's a lot of fun having a good time. So I just pray that, I, I really pray that you will just consider these things. Look inside. You get the concept. How big is your barn? Don't let God determine for you. You make the choice. Yeah, that's enough. And now it's time to be generous and watch God move in your behalf. Amen? Amen. God bless you as you give. God bless you as you give online. And I pray, Lord, for the church that we would be good stewards and an awesome example of what kingdom people do with God's kingdom resources for today and for tomorrow, as long as you tarry in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless you.